So this work in front of us, Queer Sydney History, was a large commission from Sydney University for the official library and it details queer history in Sydney over this huge gulf of chronological time and it's got so many storied elements. My first question I want to ask you was about some of the interesting stories that populate this piece. So one, uh, one story I really wanted to point out was uh, obviously, you know, there have been 65,000 years of indigenous culture in Australia, but the first recorded European instance of homosexuality was this very jarring story of these two Dutch boys who were on a ship that was shipwrecked on West Australian coast, and in the captain's log, it just recorded that they had been convicted of sodomy. So what they did was they actually marooned the two boys on separate islands, and the two boys had to watch each other basically starved to death as they sailed off. And that is the, the, the first point in this continent that a European wrote down those words in the first recorded history. And it's so jarring to think yeah, of it as that. Because it really sets the tone of all the struggles that yeah. one would have to go through. I think there's a beautiful depiction of them where you represent them as islands that are embracing yes. each other. And it's yeah. kind of this almost poetic, like, you know, what life could they have lived if they... Exactly. And it's also, you know, not only uh, representing history as it is, because it's been so dark for queer people for mm. so long, it's also kind of, in a fun way, having an imagination of what might have been, what could be, you know, a lot of the history is not written. It's, mm. un, it's unspoken, so it's imagining. And even like some of the Australian legend kind of terminologies like mateship and things like that, that, that there's a queering and building up of... Like, yeah, those absolutely. Words. You know, there's, and there's, mm. you know, the whole idea is that queer people have always existed and mm. they always will exist, but their history has not. So it's not been, you know, had a proper light shone on it. But yeah. if you scratch the surface, just as like in this map, there are you know, hundreds and hundreds of stories of mm. hidden romances, roommates, bachelors, mm. bush rangers, you know, military people, soldiers, all of these hidden histories that this is basically just scratching the surface of what really is, is there. What's another archival story amongst the colonial period of this map? I mean, a really incredible one is the story of Captain Moonlight and, uh, uh, his lover James Nesbitt. So Captain Moonlight was a bush ranger, a bit like Ned Kelly, and he fell madly in love with one of his companions. Mm -hmm. And they were actually in a shootout, and his his lover James Neb Nesbitt was shot. And there's a very famous, you know, colonial cartoon of you know him mm -hmm. holding his lover and saying, you know, I, he was beside himself. Mm -hmm. uh, and then when he was in prison and eventually hung. He said that he wanted his grave to be the resting place with James. So eventually they actually were buried together. But it, ca it caused a bit of a scandal because the court reporters were saying this is so bizarre, this like super macho, you know, <laughs> bush ranger was in love with one of his companions. And he was actually, I believe, hung at the what is now the National Art School. Like he was actually you know, killed there, which is That's so surreal. You know, not that I went to National Art School, but I know it very especially well. Especially with Qtopia being right next to National yes, Art School now, yeah. how there's a full circle and re relation to art there. Yeah, um, absolutely. We won't get to that just now. Mm -hmm. uh, I think um, the next era that uh, we'll mm -hmm. begin looking at is around Federation or perhaps early 1910s or Yeah, 20s. so I was looking at, uh, if you can see over here, sort of the World War I, uh, the Anzacs, and the whole idea. I guess it's also linked with mateship, that there's mm -hmm. been a whole, you know, men out on the frontier, not a lot of women around, <laughs> a bit like prisons, yeah. shacking up together, but then also the idea of mateship, it's friendship, but it's also having your buddies back. It's also love, it's a kind of love. So it's not hard to imagine mateship as also a sexual also, component as well. Yeah, I guess having one's back is also a yeah, I mean, if you wanna If you wanna <laughs> yeah. go there. So World War I, I was imagining, you know, lots of people say Australia's, you know, colonial white identity was established in World War yeah. I because it was 
you know, Gallipoli, all of our myths come from there. So I have a lot of myths, you know, the, the man from Snowy River and the sheep shearing. And I, and I just, there's a very, yeah, there's a lot of male masculine-ness uh, that I think, you know, oftentimes when cultures or societies are hyper-masculine, there's often this sub- subtle homoeroticism in that hyper-masculineness. Yeah, I, I didn't even know um, Tom Roberts' uh, Shearing of the Rams was there. Yes. Wow. Um, so I've seen you build up this work since its inception. So I've, I've seen you go through the various eras. Um, before we continue on with the piece, I, I did want to ask you, to get to this point, um, h- how many books did you have to read? What was some of the archival research that you did to um, begin filling out these kind of spotty history? So the, the sort of bible for this work is Gary Wotherspoon's incredible uh, Gay Sydney a History. And even mm. the title of the work I reference, you know, Queer Sydney a History. Yeah. So uh, Gary Wotherspoon's book was very much focused on gay male history, mm. but it touched upon a broad history. And then there was a great documentary actually that came out after this work was made called Queer Australia, Queer Australia. Mm. And that actually went through a much broader look at um, queer history in Australia. But obviously this is focused particularly on Sydney itself. Yeah. So it was Gary's book that was a major impetus. There was lots of um, early colonial writings he referenced a lot of historical archive documents, diaries, court reports, things like that. Really up until you know the 60s and 70s, so much of that history was court proceedings, uh, you know, diaries of people that had been killed. Mm-hmm. It was always through a frame of private views or criminalization. Mm-hmm. There wasn't this open, unless there were like letters to a lover, it's, there was never yeah. this declarative stuff. So it was just fascinating that most of his references in his incredible book were court proceeding I books. I can't imagine the level yeah. of archival depth yeah. that the book would have come into. Incredible. It would have been a great read. And actually one of the highlights of working now as a curator at Qtopia was I actually got to interview and meet Gary and I showed him the map, he's actually in the map as well, uh, and it was just a great Which full circle that, moment. That is, in a very true sense, a full circle Yes, <laughs> okay. literally. Going Before on. I take you to present time though, mm. let's continue to sure. slowly build our way up. So, the Archibald Fountain, that yes. being a early hookup spot. Yeah, so... In the UK, there's this term called um, cottaging, which is basically gay men going to public toilets and having sex. It's called cottaging. In Australia, we have our own word, which is called a beat, which is a place, usually a semi-public place, where, you know, gay men would go and and have sex. And it was one of the few places that they could go to. And as you can see in the map, you've got the Archibald Fountain. In the 20s and, and 30s, it was a key be place. You'd go to Hyde Park, you'd meet at the fountain, then you'd go and have sex in the toilets. Uh, and even the, I, as you can see, I don't draw the entire fountain, I draw a part of it, which is, you know, the... the grabbing ma- the bull's Yeah, hole. grabbing the bull's yeah. hole, which is very homoerotic, I think, in itself. Being that, like, naked neoclassical yes. thing, I imagine yeah. it would have just been an evocative place to go with. Of course, uh, yes, and, yeah. it, and, and it's, it's sexy. It's mm. like, you know, it would be a great place for that. I've also got in the sort of 20s, 30s section, the Max Dupain sunbaker, but again, mm. using queer imagination, you know, instead of just the solitary sunbaker, I imagine him with another man, another mm. partner. Then you've also got, you know, The Well of Loneliness, a classic lesbian novel. Des Tooley, who was a famous um, baritone singer, jazz singer in the city, uh, also really interesting was the artist balls which were the balls that were held at town hall at sydney town hall and these mm-hmm. were for art students but also the art community and these yeah. were in the 20s and 30s and they were notoriously debauched you know <laughs> people would have wild costumes they really were the, the kind of what mardi gras has become now but in the 20s and 30s. And it was in the 30s that the Vice Squad came in and shut it down. But that was those, you know, talking about the, the wild 20s, the roaring 20s, it was the artist balls that where people would really go. And, and I love that the art community itself was one of the first places that people would go to to have these really crazy fun parties. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, oh, that, that's really fascinating. So 
At this point, Sydney University yes. comes into the yep. picture. Um, were there any particular stories about Sydney University that you came across specifically because the map is full of Sydney University? Yes, so they had um, their own magazine, uh, which um, I can't remember the name of it, but basically Sydney University was at the forefront of the early queer movement in Sydney because it was often student-led. You know, the, the 78 is the first Mardi Gras marches often most of them from what i've uh heard and read were students activist yeah. students so sydney uni unsw all of the universities really were at the forefront of pushing that uh, that you know progressive liberal agenda uh you can actually see in the map i've got fisher library and it says you are here so i'm almost inviting the viewer when they're looking at the map to think about the placement of the original work mm -hmm. and what's so beautiful about its placement it's in the stairwell official library is if you go one stair level up a uh, William Dobell painting is right across and William Dobell was mm -hmm. a queer man so it's it's a, I love that you know he's even in the map that they you've get got a this yeah the, the two two yeah. works there so um, it's this it does a little bit break the chronological chronology but you can also see above the center love and the two um, emerald city lots of references to the wizard of oz mm. and north sydney here There's Dorothy yes yeah, story to these shoes over the rainbow we're not in kansas <laughs> anymore this part here is a secondary timeline that's a timeline of the mardi gras history mm -hmm. so it's like there's actually two timelines within the whole work mm -hmm. and it starts here with the gay solidarity group it was you know t uh, basically almost 10 years since stonewall riots in new york of 1969 which is widely considered the the start of the gay rights gay and lesbian right movement and you can see it goes through 78 is has some of the famous signs and then you have some of the very famous costumes from malcolm cole and kenton Bre uh, brenton keith her and goes across all the way to the modern day and then it's actually a line up to Oxford Street and the Golden Gate Mart. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to point that out as a sort of break that Sydney Uni also stands out from the rest of the chronology. Yeah, and it's time on top of time behind time, and like there, yeah. there definitely is a play with that that goes through. Uh, so I imagine <clears throat> looking at all these various Mardi Gras floats, you chose the ones that you probably enjoyed the most or were the best reflection or representation but were there some really outlandish ones that you came across yeah i mean i have some of my favorites i love this one sodomite instead that's, of vegemite <laughs> uh the fairy bread you know you've got the dykes on bikes who have always been at the front the 78ers there on the bus um there's some very famous ones of so the um lesbian lemon ladies they they were very famous the priscilla um, sandal dress, Brent Keith's her full body um, sort of outfit, and also Malcolm Cole did a very famous, probably one of the most famous Mardi Gras costumes, which was as an Indigenous man dressing up as a drag, um, Captain Cook. So it's like this massive Captain Cook image. Yeah. Um, but it's also, I should mention the style of this work is very graphic, it's very cartoony, it's the color palette is all from the Progress Pride flag, so it's meant to be very colorful. As you can see here, you know, these basically rainbow plus black brown for uh, the different minority groups, and then the white, light pink, and light blue for the trans community. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you're able to represent a lot of these yes, groups in, in the, the middle as well. Yeah, all the groups. I wanted to get them. So it's really dense. <laughs> I yeah. keep thinking about how much more I, I could put in here. but um, I yeah. And I'll play this as I speak. I did an animation of this recently. And yes, I had to cut out incredible. every tiny little boat <laughs> and piece. And, um, I, I, I really, in, during, during that process, was able to take in just how much time it would have taken to actually fill in a work like this. And... Um, Standing yeah. back, you kind of it because it, it's it's a bit overwhelming, and you can't. There's a there's also a flatness to it with the border mm -hmm. um, that it's hard to register the the detail and time. And it's only when you get really up close 
uh, with all the colors and yeah. As like, gallery goers have come, they'll see it from the side of the room and usually have to like walk up to it and then really spend the time. And I, I think what I've noticed is like a lot of older people have um, come and pointed out, oh, I remember that. I knew him. Oh, amazing. Um, especially okay. um, on that tear that you've done. Oh, let's, yes. Let's yes. not okay. jump into that just yet. I'm trying to show restraint right now. <laughs> So, so we're up to the 40s and yeah, 30s, 40s. yeah. You've got James Dean. Well, yes, well, just going back slightly, you've got Patrick White and you've also got the Hidden Lives and the Great Depression in the Harbour Bridge, the, you know, Californian bungalow house. Polari here underneath the Lunar Park face is very famous uh, gay slang from the 50s and 60s that yeah. gay men would use that people could come and eavesdrop on and they wouldn't understand what they were talking about. So. This is still in sort of the criminalization coded. World War Two. I didn't stay much on, but you've got that famous kiss in uh, Times Square, but I've made two uh, nurses there. And also the very um, sort of lesbian, uh, you know, we can do it poster. Mm -hmm. What's so fascinating in my research is just like the AIDS epidemic, World War Two, which is, you know, the darkest chapter of the 21st century, mm -hmm. Uh, yes, it, it is so fascinating because both of those horrific times mm. actually had unintended positive consequences. Mm. And one of the big consequences of World War II was you had lots of queer people who were enrolled into the military, put together in close confines, and mm. there was like a flourishing of queer culture within World War II, which you never would have imagined. And there were lots of reports of all the gay stuff that was going on you know in Australia there was you know in Thailand and Singapore it's a whole history of soldiers dressing in drag and doing performances for each other to entertain each other you know during war and so actually World War II enabled a lot of people who were isolated it globalized the world but it also enabled a lot of queer people to meet other queer people and you really saw from World War II onwards an explosion of you know, and people meeting each other. Started and yeah. networks yeah. began to be made. I should also point out the pink triangle, which is a very powerful, it's also repeated here with the 78ers. The pink triangle was used by the Nazis to indicate homosexuals in the, in the concentration camps. And they had a whole series of different uh, colors and codes for gypsies, disabled people, communists, you know, all the different groups. But that pink triangle was a, a, a really horrific uh, symbol that's now been adopted by the queer community mm -hmm. in many ways because our history is so often horrible things, mm -hmm. words been put on us that we then claim as our own and we, mm -hmm. we take that ownership back. So there's a really fantastic and complex history of that pink triangle that um, is so evocative. It says so much about not only the horror of that period, but also resilience and reclaiming and power. And moving on together yeah. and striving. Um, so now 50s. we're in the 50s yeah. and this was just after the war. And yeah. You've got a few performers. Um, yes, uh, Robert Heldman, the famous uh, ballet dancer. This is sort of a butch lesbian, James Dean. Mm -hmm. uh, you've also got Ida Leeson, who was a lesbian, who was a l famous librarian at Sydney, um, the State Library of New South Wales, I should say. The Kinsey Report came out famously in America, mm -hmm. which documented how much mm -hmm. more prevalent homosexuality was and how many people mm -hmm. engaged in that. So that really led to the decriminalization movement so then you had in the uk you know the bill in the 60s to decriminalize we had the trenthowan committee which actually never published their um their recommendations but we believe that they were also encouraging the government to decriminalize because mm. the police couldn't keep up with arresting all these gay people all the mm. time um, you also got like the lavender scare in the in the cold war era where Gay men in particular were seen as security risks, so the government would try and purge all the government departments of queer people because they saw them as 
in cahoots mm. with the communists. And there was the famous Cambridge Five, the spies, the worst spies in British history, and a lot of them actually were gay, so it's quite funny. Um, and you've also got a jukebox and Queen Elizabeth sort of kissing herself, mm. Marilyn Monroe, the, the white picket fence. That yeah, the nuclear era, family. Nuclear family. <laughs> yeah, like the gendering, swapping the gender of them. And then you have, this is actually meant to be the Parramatta River. <laughs> so mm. It's very abstracted, but you can kind of see. And then coming into the 60s, 60s were really the period where not just for queer people, for everybody, for, you know, ethnic minorities, for women, for the feminist movement, everything blew up in the 60s. So you have the pill here, you have, um, you know, the sexual revolution. This is an example of the Beefcake magazine. So in the 50s and 60s, there were these uh, physical magazines that men would use. They were the first form of pornography because they were just like oiled up, you know, Greco-Roman men. And that was another version of coded history mm -hmm. that they had to go through. And the pill is fascinating because it really was the rupture between sexuality and pregnancy for women. So it, mm -hmm. it, it, it freed women to be sexually liberated. So I feel yeah. like the pill is also linked with the queer movement as well, mm -hmm. breaking away from sex as just procreation. Yeah, and so much of the later... Uh, messages and parts you put in there are based on the pharmacological age yes, and kind of yeah, what that represented so that being the antithesis or the beginning of that is mm. very interesting and then yeah. you've got things like the bikini lay girls was a very famous sort of um not cabaret but kind of like uh performers who were in king's cross in carlotta who was a trans performer who's still alive uh, would perform in these kind of like cabaret kind of nightclub environments and straight people would go there and they're very high end. Mm -hmm. uh, you've also got the Daughters of Blitless, which was the first queer movement in Australia. Um, it was for lesbians and Capriccio's a uh, um, gay bar. I've got a Liechtenstein here and mm -hmm. she's saying maybe I'm a lesbian. <laughs> uh, moon landing. And then you have here this really seminal moment in 69, which is the Stonewall Riots. Even though it wasn't in Australia, it was a very important and it's seminal a moment yeah, yeah, for the whole. Mardi Gras was like the 10 year anniversary after that. Mm -hmm. uh, and I've copied some. And then you've got the 70s here with Peter Allen. 70s saw like some would say a golden age of gay sex because mm. it was pre-AIDS. You know, I've, I've interviewed a 78 and he was saying it was, <laughs> everyone was having sex with everyone every, all, mm. everywhere. Yeah. Uh, and uh, you had this really sexualized images of Tom of Finland. And um, I've also got Marsha P. Johnson in the Stonewall Riot was, you know, a, um, you know, uh, a, African-American drag queen who was one of the instigators of the Stonewall riots mm. and a very powerful person. Ella Main Fountain around Darlinghurst, King's Cross. And then you come to the 70s where you have the real important moment in Sydney and Australia's queer history, which was campaign against moral persecution. And as Gary says, that was the turning point that was the moment where people came out of the closet you had the first kiss on television peter dewall and peter bonsall boone on abc checkerboard mm. um, you had you know coming out of the closet gay liberation then you have the first mardi gras which sort of links with this history here mm. and you can see stop police attacks on gays women and blacks and that was june 24th 1978 mm. but what's so dramatic is that that night, which is really the landmark moment in a, in Sydney's queer history, you know that yeah. that started the Mardi Gras movement. It was in response to extreme police brutality, where these people were taken to the jail, which is now Qtopia. Mm -hmm. They were beaten up, they were harassed, uh, and then only you know that's seventy eight, the first uh, recorded case of HIV in Australia was 82 so that's four years later yeah. from that moment to then have the darkest time chapter which is the mid to late 80s and early 90s and that's when you had the explosion of HIV in Australia and so you have here you know a map of Oxford Street um, the Hanky Code which was a, a 70s series of 
hankies. You, you put, put it in, in the back pocket. Yeah, and yeah. you could tell what sexual position you wanted. And you have the New South Wales decriminalization in 84. But around this period, um, young, healthy, fit gay men started wasting away and dying. Mm. And it, a lot of people I've spoken to who lived through that period describe it as a war. Even one of my supervisors said every couple of weeks he was going to a funeral. You know, people were just dying left, right and center. And what's so interesting is after the first Mardi Gras, um, the lesbians kind of they, there was sort of a separation emerging between lesbians and gays because they, you know, there was criticisms of too much focus on the gay community and, and the lesbians were sort of left behind. And originally that acronym LGBTQI, it actually originally started with gay men. It was GLGBTQI. But because of the HIV epidemic, lesbians came and looked after all these sick and dying gay men yeah. as a tribute they changed it to put l at the beginning of that That's yeah which touching, is really yeah. beautiful and here i i had the uh, very famous you know act up silence equals death keith herring um you've got the david mcdonald works also the very infamous uh um grim reaper ads from the 80s where mm. the government wanted to basically scare everyone into the, not just the gay community but the, queer, uh, the straight community as well into realizing that everyone is at risk and so the these grim reapers are bowling these bowling balls and there's all these families at the end who are the 10 pin a lot of people found that those those ads extremely confront it scared the hell out of australia but it did lead to a massive rise in safe sex and use of condoms mm -hmm. so really to this is probably one of the most important parts of the map because mm -hmm. i didn't know how to draw the hiv epidemic and so difficult i couldn't draw someone you know in a hospital bed yeah. and it was I remember crying, having to hold my eyes from tears going on the paper, just reading and thinking about it. And so I came up with this idea of a, a physical rip in the map. It's so hyper-colored, so celebratory, but here you've got some of the names of some key. And it's got a yeah. candle and a point of reference. Yes, to, that yeah. people understand. But also that, you know, uh, the whole idea of white as death, it's actually in China. <laughs> Black doesn't equal death, white does. And I really love that in such a colorful work, having that void, it reminds you of the- Towards the light or- Yeah, and the gap that's left, you know, the gap that there's all of these, there's a whole generation of men who don't exist now, leaders and heroes who were cut short. So um, yeah, and I, I really was purposeful to have the rip go all the way into sort of the present day here, so it's still, Existed. Carries on. Yeah. yeah. Um, should I continue down? Yes, <laughs> Guess please. We're already do. Here. This is fascinating. So here we have, you know, you've got the candlelight rally. Um, you've got these uh, famous names of men. Obviously, there are. I think they were saying probably more than twenty thousand people were killed in that period. And what's so interesting is, even though the AIDS was most prevalent in the 80s most deaths occurred in the early 90s because it took a while for people to die so even though the 80s is associated with hiv it's interesting to realize that actually in the early 90s was the highest rates of death it wasn't until 1996 that you started to have the antiretroviral treatments that came in and that actually made it more manageable. So from 1982 with the first case at St. Vincent's Hospital to 1996, it was untreatable. And so it was for many people a death sentence. And it wasn't, that's a, a big amount of time. Yeah, that's like uh, over a decade of yeah. just no treatment. Uh, and then slowly, as I said, with World War I, with AIDS, it not only brought together lesbians and gays again, it also, the positive impact was it created a politicized community. It engaged the government with the uh, queer community, unlike in America and Europe, where there was a huge divide between you know, Thatcher and Reagan, mm. who were very conservative. Reagan didn't say the word AIDS for many, many years into it. Mm. And, countless people died from their indifference it wasn't and, until bush senior right that stuff actually yeah stuff it had really happened. had took a long time yeah. before things happened so australia actually had one of the best responses to aids in the world we had um you know 
Neil, uh, sorry, what's his name? Neil Blewett, who was the health minister, and we also had Bill Bowtell, who was, you know, gay as well, who really helped instigate all of these programs. We had needle sharing, because it wasn't just gay men, it was also drug addicts sharing needles, transferring blood, mm. sex workers as well. There was, it was a whole community response that was very grassroots driven, mm. very different from the kind of politicized environment in America and, and Europe. Here we have the AIDS Memorial Quilt. It's to this day the largest community artwork in the world. And it was established originally in the United States in uh, the Washington uh, Mall. They covered the whole mall in like, I don't know, hundreds of meters of these. And the boxes are almost like the size of coffins. And they would have written on them the names of people who died and then like a picture of something. So. Australia has its own version of it. We have our own memorial quilt, uh, and I had to reference it there. Also, the famous book, Timothy Conagrave's Holding the Man, which is a really classic Australian story about you know, HIV in that era. Ward 17 South at St. Vincent's Hospital was the epicenter for treatment of, um, the, for gay men. And uh, it's, it's so interesting that, you know, that hospital, which is in Darlinghurst, which is the highest proportion of gay men in the country, yeah. it's near Qtopia, you know, the whole area is such a rich history, which also comes through. And then as you get out of that, you've got AZT, which is the first treatment system. You go into the era of safe sex. So in this era, you'd have these famous posters like Condom Man, which was promoting safe sex. Mm. And there was this morality that came in for the gay community. So if you're going to have sex without a condom, you were a bad gay. And there was this really like push towards that. So it's, you know, the, the trauma from that period lingers all the way to the present day. But mm. as we go on, 80s fall of the Berlin Wall, Macintosh. I should also point out Lee Bowery, famous Australian artist. You compare Lee Bowery's performance outfit with Tom of Finland, the jarring difference, you know, the yeah. hyper-sexualized freedom of the 70s to the whole body covered up because the body was a site of infection and fear. So it's, I had to reference that. Um, and then when we come down to the 90s, 2000s and 2010s, it's filled with all of these living people, heroes such as Troughman, William Yang, Gary Symes, Gary Wallaceboon, Ian Roberts, Dennis Altman, um, you've got Priscilla, Invention of the Internet, September 11th, The Gay Games, Trans Rights, and we're coming into sort of the 2000s, Kate McGregor, Justice Virginia Bell, Crimson Bell, um, you mentioned the iPhone, then you come to multiculturalism, and you've got marriage equality, and all these different characters, and you know, that was a very big moment in queer history, the plebiscite, 61.6% voted yes, mm -hmm. And then when I was drawing the, this is in late 2020, I was imagining what the future would be because I wanted to have a little bit of the future. So this whole North Sydney part is all the buildings are crazy futuristic buildings. And obviously you've got the Yes logo from that time. World Pride, which happened at the beginning of this year was about to happen. But I'm really pleased because I put in two things that have actually occurred. I put in future ban on conversion therapy, which is at the moment a bill is going through parliament. And then I also put in Qtopia, where I'm so lucky to now actually have a job as a curator there. And this is the old Darlinghurst jail. Uh, and at the time, I couldn't even have imagined that I would end up getting a curation job there, so. Yeah, and um, what, what does Qtopia hope to uh, do as far as their exhibitions are concerned? So, uh, Qtopia originally was I've got here Qtopia Museum. The word museum's actually been removed because it was, it's the old Darlinghurst jail where the original 78ers were taken. The building was decommissioned as a prison holding cell in 1987 and then was a health center. It's now been gifted to Qtopia. The word Qtopia comes from queer and utopia and it's really an envisioning of a better queer world and it's not a museum it's a place to tell stories it's a place for the community to tell its own stories about its own history yeah. so there'll be multiple ongoing exhibitions of every single aspect of the community art lectures 
performances, the whole gambit. It's, it's a really impressive and very ambitious um, project and it will be slowly rolled out, opening in 2024 for Mardi Gras next year. And um, yeah, I can't really talk about all the things that are happening, no, but it's, it's very really awesome. exciting, yeah. It's gonna be really, really thrilling. And thank you for being so generous and walking through pleasure. this period of time. But now that I kind of have you, having gone through it, uh, I, I did want to talk a little bit about your graphic style. Yeah. So I've seen your early 2011 output, um, Legoland, and that was one of the first times you'd actually used um, color and textures in that way. Yeah. Um, and then you've got your earlier honors works like uh, Saint Sebastian, which you uh, see here at Draw Space. So you've got this prolonged relationship with colour, but I think over the years, and it might be part of the commission element, but you've definitely embraced it in a more full-on sort of way. So I, I, I did want to ask you about your relationship with colour to start with. I mean, it's so fascinating because my early drawings are all black and white so they were all they're all cross-hatch style they were very much like etching style i did a lot of printmaking when i was younger and uh, it was a very like albrecht durer old almost um classic drawing techniques yeah as i did the legoland work which was very block legoland people like lego figures are so blocky and they had that color it really suited that mm -hmm. and i avoided color because I feel like color has such a history to it also the kind of realistic colors I think with pen that's very complex to get yeah. realistic colors with pen what is so good with textures is they offer non-realistic colors they offer like a hyper psychedelic level of color mm -hmm. so when I have used color I use it in Miss Bloomsby, my Tim Olson winning one, that was more realistic. I was trying to, even though it was graphic, I was trying to uh, use colors that sort of associated, Tonality, yes, so, and yeah. things. But what I realized was um, I wasn't using the medium in the way that I think it is best suited to. It actually is suited to hyper graphic, hyper colorful, sort of crazy palette. And so that's what drew me to it. Also with my style, you can see there are some cross-hatching uh, elements, but I've mainly gone for almost like an iconic graphic element. And the idea was I wanted to like street signs, like advertisements. There are ways in graphic images that you can very, very quickly explain a lot of things. If yeah. I was to do a very intricate detailed drawing of these scenes i don't think they'd translate it's and almost like you need signposts that yeah, are really and, and graphic to visual anchors to focus on but yeah. it is interesting that like as you approach the different eras in this work your approach to line work gets a lot looser and more pop like um yes. so the, the colonial era probably does have the most involved use of cross hatching but then um, which was intentional. I yeah. really had that old style and you've got more of the pop art coming in and then you come around to this very kind of graphic um, element there. And if you notice, I don't, I don't think I've actually told anyone this, but if you notice at the very base level, because it is actually a landscape and it's a map, mm -hmm. there are, there's a, an urban development growing. So if you look here, you can see trees and then you look, it's like farms, there's like farmland and then you have like terrace houses and you continue on to more suburban elements and then you go all the way around more suburbs then you get into more buildings yeah and then you can see here it actually gets more and more dense into there, there is a huge visual shift there and i do like that it moves into futurism in that very like yeah. pronounced way crazy and diamond city yeah mm. and i and the last thing i'd say is at the core of all these hundreds of words and hundreds of images uh i really thought what is what is it all about yeah. You know, what is the whole history about? And at, at its core, it's about love. And mm. so that's why I wanted to have in the middle, yes, it's a celebratory work, but love is the true anchor of the whole thing that love binds it all together. And eternal love with the eternity across yeah, the eternity bridge. Yeah, eternity forever. So I think that that and the two rainbows 
coming in together. Mm. Um, yeah, it's it's such a powerful piece. And Thanks, Dana. congratulations on like I, I think it's been noticed and looked at for the reason is because it has such an involved and captivating quality to it. Okay. Um, so you recently also wrote a catalogue essay mm-hmm. on um, the use of textures. Um, what were some of the reflections um, that you'd come across that you haven't spoken about so far? I mean, I think uh, we're both on the board, founding members, yep. you before me, <laughs> of Draw Space, and um, your practice has drawing in it as well. But as, as someone, as both of us who are, are drawers, there's this real element of what is drawing, you know, why is it, why is drawing looked at the way it is? What is the associations with drawing? And so when I was really thinking about it, I was like, drawing, unlike painting or sculpture, is so linked with the genesis of thought and with the mind. You know, yeah. so many people pick up a pen, they'll doodle, they'll write something. It's the most easy, accessible way. So I really think that thought and drawing are so linked and that's what was one of the main points I was trying to make. And texture as well mm. is linked in with that because text is It's very the immediacy, accessible. it's the yeah. fluidity of mind. Yeah. And I, I do think your work being so laden with philosophy in it, like that there is definitely this connect to wanting to have that truest sense of um, I think in your master's thesis you looked at Jean and all these different... Yeah, psychology. It was yeah. a lot of psychology and philosophy in my master's, mm-hmm. yeah. And, and psychological mapping in a sense, yeah. And even in some senses, I guess, automatic drawing, probably not in this piece, but in yeah. other pieces. Yeah. yeah, like the flow, like what? Mm-hmm. why do people draw what they draw? Mm-hmm. Can you draw from your unconscious? I mean, mm-hmm. I was touching on that in the master's, but who knows, like it's mm-hmm. a whole... It's a whole thing <laughs> all right well let's move to another piece yes. now okay and yeah thank you jeremy thanks for going through this piece <laughs> 